Uh, welcome to the digital launch of Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Silky Bebi, and I am um, currently working as a marketing manager with a luxury boutique hotel brand here in Sydney. Um, and honoured to be given the opportunity here today um, to be uh, on an op opportunity to be a co-chair of PCC Sydney branch. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning um, and taking the time out of your weekend, basically, um, for this launch. Um, so just as a brief, um, for those who haven't had the chance to actually jump on board um, the website as yet, the Punjabi Chamber is a not-for-profit organisation that aims to unite the local and global Indian Punjabi community um, of all faiths um, through commerce and cooperation by offering programs, networking events, career growth opportunities, discounts and member benefits to various services and products. Um, I've also been given the opportunity this morning to, um, and privilege of introducing um, our committee members um, who come from various industries with a wealth of knowledge um, and experience and talent between, between all of us. Um, I'd like to start with um, the co-chairs, um, myself, um, Silky Bebby, obviously, um, and I've got with me Kevin Singh, who's um, Sales Director at Alterex, yep, Alterex, um, and the other committee members I'd like to introduce you to this morning, we have Amrit Bajaj, who's Director Principal of Dream Big Realty, Irvine, who's Sales and Marketing Intern of Blazaclan Technologies. We have Ishita Sepi, Barrister, Director and Advisor. Uh, we have Jay Sepi, Senior Sales Executive for Ray White Commercial. Jasvinda Kamra, uh, Private Banker, uh, Banking Professional. Uh, Bankage Bharti, who's a Startup Community Manager. Bayal Kakriya, who's an International Transformational Speaker. Uh, Mr. Pratinder Singh, uh, Director PSB Advisors, Chartered Accountant. Um, Bani Simokor Kohli, Postgraduate in International Business and International Relations. Uh, now I am honoured uh, to now give the floor over to Gurpreet uh, Pasrucha, who's also known as Gary, um, a highly seasonal um, attorney by profession. And he's also the founder and trustee of the Punjabi uh, Chamber of Commerce. So over to you, Gurpreet. Thank you, Silky. And uh, welcome everybody down under. And I understand it's uh, summer for you guys. And unfortunately out here uh, in New Jersey, where I'm at right now, it is snowing and it has been snowing for the last two weeks. So it's uh, quite a challenge. But anyway, uh, welcome to everyone in Sydney and, and God bless you all. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk about uh, the PCC and what it really is about. So let me give you some background. When I started my practice a long time ago, um, more than 25 years ago, I really did not know anyone when I started and I said, wouldn't it be great if we can start our practice and have people and people that can help us. So then what we did for what I did when we first started this is we said, okay, how do we create a group that's going to help us and that's going to provide a platform that really doesn't discriminate against anyone. And that, that really provides a wonderful opportunity for everyone to collaborate and do this. So in 2017, 2018, we went to the Punjabi community here in New York and New Jersey. And we basically said, we need to do something different. We don't wanna create a group that's really just benefits a few. We want to create a group that's going to benefit our community, men, women, um, established merchants, and the professionals uh, as well. So we went to the community, we raised uh, a decent amount of money, 
and we started the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce. So the Punjabi Chamber of Commerce uh, from day one has been dedicated to uniting and helping our Punjabi community. Now, uh, the basic thing that we do is that we have a strict policy of no religion and no politics. And as you know, a lot of groups are partisan or they're religious, and we are not one of those groups. We're not the group for those things. We are a chamber of commerce that basically also helps professionals as well. And that's probably the easiest way of looking at us. Uh, or another way of looking at us is that we're like LinkedIn for the Indian Punjabi community, okay? And we also mix um, helping entrepreneurs as well. So our members are, I was surprised as how many diverse members that we have um, amongst us. So we have CEOs of, of companies, we have professionals who are working for large companies and, and we have people who own one gas station or one convenience store. So we have so such a huge amount of diversity in our Punjabi community and, and really it makes it very, very fun uh, for us. So, you know, we discussed about this, how do we make this platform work for everyone? And what we came up with, and, and it's still a work in progress, is a platform which of course has a directory. Ginny, if you could go to the next slide. You know, um, which has directory, which has a lot of other features. So, you know, a lot of people for us, you know, they keep asking us, why are you doing this? And what, you know, what is, you know, key problem, Maggie, why do we need to do this? And this is really motivated by our everyone's desire to help our community and to provide a better place for our children, for the next generation. And as you know, our community, even though we're not supposed to be, our community has been fragmented, not united. We're broken up with religious lines, caste lines. Even amongst the six, we are broken up through Baradri and other things. And quite frankly, it's really damaged our community and it's held us back. So when we created this platform, we said, look, Let's create something that can bring harmony, that can help us all work together and really provide a channel for our future and, um, and for helping uh, our present as well. So the features of our platform essentially is that we have a searchable directory, we have classifieds, we have in-app messaging, um, we just started our discount program, which you guys can look up, where merchants can offer discounts to members. And you know we have job section, we have our mentor connect, and now we're look we're starting our global angel network. So for uh, if you need uh, investments, uh, if you need investors, and you need other things, we can try to help you. And of course, working together, we can work on getting group benefits and other things. But the, the first and foremost thing is that we are a free network. We're supported by the community and we're for the community, we say. So through the generous support of our trustees and our advertisers, our corporate advertisers primarily, we're able to provide this service for the community and um, on a global level as well. So as part of our process, what we do, and you're looking at some of the uh, events that we did, when people were actually meeting in person, which seems like, my goodness, eons ago, but we hold events, information seminars where people can network prior to the event, they get to know each other, they can network, they can do things together. And usually we have media, we have other folks that, that join. You're looking at an event that we did in Manhattan uh, featuring entrepreneurs. It was a wonderful event. And so we have many various types of events that we do. And in, in particular, anything to do with commerce, uh, self-fulfillment, uh, you know, this is our you're looking at our gala that we did, 
with Anupam Kerr and a few others, right? So, you know, funny story about the gala. We, when we did our gala in 2019, we really thought that we were never going to be able to attract anyone to the gala. So we started off with seating for only 200 and we sold that out within about five, six days. And then we added another 50 seats and another 75 seats and that sold out very quickly. And by the end of the day, we had to take the buffet tables out and bring them, put them outside the hall. And then we actually had to rent another hall for the buffets. And we ended up getting almost 425 people and it was sold out. And so the response from the community has been really energizing and that's what really keeps us all going. You know, and especially as Punjabis, what gives us the best feeling? It's not about eating or anything else, it's about feeding. We were talking about food before we started this webinar. And the happiness that we get in helping others and giving back to others is, is really what this platform is about. And getting someone a job in particular. You know, we had, I'll give you one small example. We had someone who called us from Amritsar and he said, said, look, you guys are helping everybody else. Can you help me too? And I said, what happened, young man? He said, you know, this is COVID here. I lost my job. My brother lost his job and we really, really, you know, I need a job desperately. What can you guys do? And I posted it in several places. And then literally the next day, he got two interviews. So this, these are things that we can do. We have foreign students also contacting us worldwide who are looking for work, who are looking to normalize in their communities, or who just need some, some support. And this is something that we can all do in our communities. You know, let's give back a little bit and it doesn't really take much. Just help them. And so that's all we're trying to say. So our local chapters are really, I would say, our lifeline or our blood of our community, of our group. And you know, I'm proud to tell you that we have over 200 uh, volunteers worldwide right now. And our chapter leaders, our, our chapter committee members are really, you know, at, at the forefront of our group. We are not a centralized group. And we, we understand and we believe that this has to be a movement which involves everyone and which gives everyone an opportunity to participate. So when we're um, going now to your area in Sydney, what we're asking for is how can we help you first? What are your needs? How can our, our team members help you? Because every community has a slightly different need. And so that's one starting point for us, right? Another starting point also is that how can we use this platform to, to basically uh, help others, not just for commerce, but for other things. And that comes into philanthropy. And so I'm proud to tell you that we do have a foundation, the Punjabi Chamber Foundation, and we're working on a lot of different initiatives. We started off with the COVID relief. And Ginny, I don't know if you're gonna show that, Right, um, and we started off with COVID relief and now we're progressing to having a global scholarship fund. And just this week we sent some resources, some, some funds to Amrisar for a school. And for your students out there, we also started a global youth squad to allow the young Punjabi students to network. So we're very, very proud of this. And this is something that's really 
taken off on its own. We didn't do anything. And uh, the kids came up to us, the, the young adults and said, hey, we wanna give back too. So we're working on all these initiatives and we're, we're having these students who are, who are the leaders. You're looking at all these webinars that we've done, you know, and these, this is what we've been doing for the last, you know, eight to 10 months, you know, all these virtual webinars, of course, because this is the only way we can, uh, you know, obviously meet nowadays. But, and this is an upcoming one on AI and robotics. And this is a, a worldwide collaboration and uh, between us, Indian chapters and our DC chapter. So that's the beauty of it. We have over 200 volunteers. And I, I would tell you that we probably have the largest and best Punjabi think tank right now in the world. We got so many wonderful people, doctors, lawyers, accountants, business owners, startup specialists, you know, data scientists, uh, you know, people in hospitality, healthcare. So it's just, it's, it's wonderful when you see this kitchery coming together and, and how it really helps and how everyone gives back. And these are just some of the things from our, um, our um, food drives that we did through the foundation. And if, if you see, we don't really just focus on philanthropy for Punjabis. We say, let's get involved in our communities. So uh, we raised about $35,000 for this COVID relief and we gave, we gave wherever it was needed. And so it's not just about helping Punjabis financially, it's about helping our communities and letting them know that Punjabis do give back, that we're not just in it for ourselves. Because a true Punjabi always gives back, Seva is in our DNA, right? So at this time, you know, what I'd like you guys to think about is we always want to give back and we're always wondering, hey, can we trust the other person? Are we doing, you know, is this person going to take our money and run or is this group, are they in it for themselves? We're not asking anything from anyone in that sense. What we're asking for from you, all of you, is that if you want to give back a little bit of your time, we're not asking for money. We're not doing a fundraise for this. We're saying, come become part of this community. Go to our website, punjabichamber.com. Learn about us, right? No commitments, I get it, right? Everybody has been jaded, right? And I always say this at all the webinars. Sare loki kenne hai ki Punjabi hor dusre Punjabi nu na agge nahi hon dega that we're like crabs, we will hold the other's leg down and we won't let the other person escape from the bucket. I have to tell you, that is the farthest from the truth. Uh, look at yourself, are you that way? And I can tell you, majority of the people are not that way. They do wanna help others. A true Punjabi will sleep on the floor but will give his or her bed for his friend, right? or for a loved one or visitor, right? And as you know, we never go hungry when we, when we go to any Punjabi's house. So we, we really do love our communities. We love each other, but we just need to channel ourselves properly. And that's what this platform uh, attempts to do is to look at on the commerce angle, how we can help each other, help our businesses grow, help the professionals expand their opportunities within their professions and how we can really do this together. So, you know, if you can become a mentor, it'll be great. If you've already succeeded and you know what the recipe for success is, why not help a young person, you know, who's looking to get ahead, right? Why not offer them some connections? So, you know, we urge you to get involved. Junia, next one, please. Right, so at this time, right, I urge you once again in conclusion, just go to punjabichamber.com, 
join. If you wish to become part of the community, if you wish to become part of the leadership team, we definitely have more openings, right? Uh, we are an open platform. We work with all other groups, right? And we urge you to become uh, part of our community. Thank you so much. And I give it back now to Sophie. Great, great. Thanks, um, Gurpreet. Thanks for sharing um, and giving us some information and some insights into um, into um, PCC. And I personally am super excited to be part of it and, um, you know, watching it grow in, in Sydney. Now, I'd like to um, introduce you all and welcome our guest speaker today, Johnny, Johnny Bala. Um, Johnny is in the business of crafting remarkable human experiences and driven to impact the lives of millions in need. Um, he's a serial brand builder and consumer experience specialist with a wealth of knowledge and expertise in F&B, retail and hospitality. Um, Johnny is a multifaceted marketer with a knack of copywriting and storytelling, delivering success to some of the fastest growing brands and agencies in the world. Now over to you, handing it over to Johnny. All righty, how are you doing guys? I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. All right, can we see it? Yes. Got it, all right, awesome. Uh, welcome everyone, uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, just wanna take you back a little, a little bit before the post pandemic world. Let's think about a time where you were overseas. Uh, perhaps you were on a short holiday, traveling for work. Uh, never, you're never really ready to go home when you're on holiday, but you have to return at some point because uh, that's exactly where your life is. You begin, you begin packing. You always, always, always check that you've got your passport in the bag. Perhaps it's the first thing that you pack. I know I do. You get ready to leave your hotel or your Airbnb, and you quadruple check all the good things that are so important to you, your phone, your passport, your wallet. Ah, it's all there, great. You make it to the airport, mentally preparing for the, the flea market that it is, getting your bags checked through, throwing your laptop and valuables onto the security belt, perhaps getting randomly selected, uh, passing through, beat free, and in a matter of seconds, you have to collect everything from the trays. As other trays are starting to pile up behind you, they start to hit you, the queue starts to build up behind you. Finally, you make it out. Oh, good. Still got two hours until check-in. Guess you'll get something to eat. Freshen up. Put yourself down. Time passes. It's boarding time. And you open up your bag to take out your passport and your boarding pass. Oh no, where is it? You start scurrying around, heart pounding, and every second you can't feel that little hard book come to your hands. You go back to the boarding gate, seats, and look under the seats, you take out everything, the pressure builds, your worry starts to dawn on you. You can't see it anywhere. You look through your home luggage, no, you didn't put it there. You might have, maybe it's in your jacket, maybe it's under the floor, under the seat. Where else could it be? Your heart is racing and then you hear, last call for boarding. What are you gonna do now? You think about where you could trace, trace back your steps, where else it could be. How will you get out of this situation? How will you prove who you are? What a feeling, right? To lose the most important ident part of your identity when traveling. Uh, it happened to me actually, uh, when I was traveling in Istanbul except I wasn't going home. I was going to Toronto from Sydney and all my identity documents proving that I was an Australian citizen were checked into my, uh, my main luggage. I could hear Mr. Bala being called on the intercom. And I thought maybe the boarding lady might know what to do. She didn't, she had no idea. She said, I would have to call the embassy. And my heart sank at 10 p.m. in the night what the hell am I going to do now? At that point, it felt like such a long time and I got a tap on the shoulder. Sir, we found your passport. You better hurry. I literally flew to the gate and I, and I ran into the flight, strapped myself in, 
like no one could get me out of this plane. All of this because I misplaced the one thing to prove who I am. Identity, powerful, right? Something that we often don't think about a lot, holds so much power over us. And without it, we are literally nobody. But that's, as, that's really as far as we think about identity. We don't really think about it from the means of what it means for us or who we're trying to be in the world. We don't really think about it, what it could mean for our business and how without knowing the brand identity process, we're set for failure. We don't know how understanding this could fundamentally change the course of our lives and our businesses for good. Identity is not, nor is ever limited to anything. It's a complex interconnected web of nuances and intricacies, which cannot be limited to one box that society attempts to place us in. We call these boxes identifiers, which can be helpful, but is largely a slippery slope, often causing exclusion and the omittance of the self rather than inclusivity. So let me tell you what identity is not, and this might shock you. Identity is not what your brand or you look like. I know, take a moment to let that sink in. Identity is not what you look like. It's merely one key pillar of the holistic identity and it's called your visual identity. Humans are really visual creatures and from a very young age, we are taught or not taught how to identify and perceive and understand things in front of us. What we don't realize is that the process of perceiving and identifying things also comes with a prepackaged bundle of biases. And these biases actually help us uh, speed up the recognition process uh, such that your, you, you become an automatic response rather than something that uh, your brain has to think long and hard about. Your brain doesn't really look like doing that anyway. So while this is really useful uh, for our brains, for our fight or flight reactions, it causes this real dependency to, uh, to be dependent on our emotions rather than logic. And over time, this becomes ingrained in our psyche and our behaviors, so much so that we don't know what we're saying or what we're doing uh, in, in certain environments. <clears throat> this can look like someone thinking that you're Indian and therefore you're smart and knowledgeable or something a little bit damaging like assuming mothers in the workplace underperform relative to single female peers. In fact, only 3% of female founders receive investment uh, in startups and it's less than 2% for minority founders. When it comes to being a part of the minority, any or any letter uh, other than M on the gender spectrum, for instance, there's this notion in the, the Western world where our visual identities has caused some constraint. Yet that is only if we let part of our, that part of our identity, the visual part, dictate the course of our existence. And this group right here, all of you right now, is a, is a testament to what we're working on and what or working towards to break through all these proverbial glass ceilings or to command that respect and recognition, which deserves uh, major congratulations and uh, major props. My childhood would be largely unsurprising to most Sikh boys growing in a household that taught and educated the way of Sikhism uh, to the best of their ability. They instilled in me a lot of incredible values about Sikhism and what it teaches you, such as being of service to all humans, uh, respecting humans and genders across uh, all equally, and having that spirit of the warrior, a lion, a sing. Yet, that was kind of hard to put into practice at a young age. Um, what appeared to be a ball on my head and uh, for people who had no idea what this meant. I'd be always watching my back, avoiding crowds, uh, hoping I wouldn't get my podcast pulled off by somebody walking past. And uh, my posture was always arched. I was trying to avoid contact by shady characters and uh, staying close to uh, teachers for protection. Uh, what didn't help, as you can see on the right, 
is uh, that my mum fed me too many gulab jamuns and I ended up looking like one. A chubby kid, a minority and a perfect target for, for uh, schoolyard bullying. My visual identity was always in question, uh, yet I knew so much from a young age that I knew how important the thing on my head was uh, to the lineage, the crown that I'm wearing, to the culture and to the, to, the, to the religion that I was born into. I was lucky to be born into it. I knew I was different and uh, all humans are different. So if everyone is different, then that must make me normal, right? Little Johnny became so obsessed and infatuated with normalizing himself, uh, purposely doing things that, or putting himself in positions that were commanding normality, not for the looks, uh, but who I was inside. I just wanted to hang out with everyone, be friends with everyone, play sports with that went cricket, uh, be a nerd, otherwise, uh, be a nerd. Otherwise, if you don't make it to uni, uh, you're going to scare the family name. I did it all because I could. And if there was any boxes that people were going to place me in, I would go out of my way to surprise and show them otherwise. While visual identity is pivotal, there are three other ones that are so much more important to recognize and own in on, to come out, come out of whatever shell uh, you or your business is in. In fact, these are so important in, in, for businesses in 2021 and beyond in the post-pandemic or pandemic worlds, that without them, you won't succeed in connecting with or growing your audience. But more about that later. Let's, talk, let's continue talking about you. The second pillar is called the environmental identity. No, this is not about naming different species or of trees and animals. It's about your direct circle of influence, your network, your family, your friends, your peers. It's about your culture, who you're affiliated with, your genetic history, the sports clubs you're a part of, the music you listen to, and all the communities that you belong to. Right now, when we're right here, right now, we're united through the environmental identity of being Punjabi. Yet once we live here, leave here, your identity will change uh, to adapt to the next environment that you go into. That doesn't mean that if you go after this, you, you go and sit on the Brazilian Chamber of Commerce call um, and that makes you not Punjabi anymore. All of the parts of your life will always require a different you. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. This quote represents the sensorial or visceral identity to a T. How do you want people to feel when they are around you? Who are you when you're the most proud of yourself? How is your relationship with your inner voice? How is that relationship when you're not performing well? It's all about the feelings. And when it comes to purchasing behavior in particular, 90% of people will purchase purely off emotion than logic. So feelings are important. The two most important days in your life are the days you are born and the day you find out why. I absolutely love this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. And this forms a premise behind the final pillar of your, exist, your, exist, final pillar, your existential identity. What is the meaning of life? What is the reason of your existence? Are you finding purpose in everything you do or are you waiting for purpose to find you? Your existential identity describes the entirety of the gift that is your life, how you choose to spend your time on earth. Ultimately, it's the intangible things you'd like people to remember you by after you're no longer here. It's a very introspective part of your identity, yet perhaps the most profound and impactful of them all. Knowing and understanding this particular identity facet uh, makes all the other parts of your identity take a lesser meaning especially visual identity. So there are a few major keys or a few things that you should keep in mind and remember. Number one, you are more than meets the eye. Your visual identity is not you. It is, not, an, it is an extension of you. It is just one part. And for any environment that you feel that your visual identity may be challenged, take that as the opportunity to put on a show Show your audience 
and surprise and delight, the surprise and delight that is you. Blow their socks off. Your identity, or most parts of it, needs to change and adapt and grow. We are humans and we are nature. And nature says that you need to keep evolving and growing. If you're not growing, you are dying. And you may never be the same person as you were yesterday. And that's exactly how it should be. Number three, your differences are your superpowers. No one wants the same thing as everyone else. Mainstream is boring and is being disrupted every day. The things that make you unique are exactly the things that will help you stand out. Embrace them, use them to your advantage. Don't play the cards that you were dealt. Start a new game. Your rules, your lane. As with how your identity is not your visual identity, the same cannot be truer for brands. Marketing outside of generating revenue and recognition is all about relationships. Everything starts and ends with the relationship. For if you don't have one or don't work to maintain a healthy one, revenue and recognition will fizzle as to the business. This is what it's supposed to look like for the best in the world. The brand being Kajal and uh, the consumer being Shah Rukh Khan running through a field, a glorious field of love. As with any fruitful re relationship, it can never be just about the looks. It can't be just about that visual identity. It's about understanding each other, falling in love, helping each other grow. Brands are now under pressure to become more human rather than all about the money. If you're perceived about the money, you probably won't get any. I want you to think about your last few purchases of something you really, really wanted and have been following for a while. Who are the brands? What do they talk about? How do they communicate? What are their beliefs? What are they, how, who do they support? How do they support you? Do they entertain you? Do they support uh, causes that you're passionate about? Are they always trying to add value to your life? Who comes to mind? Nike, Glossier, Thank You Water? In 1996, Jean-Noël Caffrera came up with Brand Identity Prism, which essentially uses the four pillars I just spoke to you about of personal identity and illustrates it in a way which combines two identities into one diagram. The sender is the concept in this, in this concept, concept sorry, <clears throat> is the brand and the receiver is the customer. Internalization on the right is how the brand's identity of itself is what the brand's identity is of itself uh, in your customer's eyes. Externalization on the left is how the brand perceives cus the customer's identity. And it's a nice fusion of both identities. I won't bore you with too much detail about this tool, though it is useful. And we can do, look at a quick example for Nike. What you can read on the screen or know about Nike is how it crafts inherent feelings and behaviors with its consumers and, and encourages, them, encourages them in them to be a lot bigger and better than who they are. It enables them and empowers them and motivates them. It, in return, consumers become advocates for the brand and reciprocate through loyalty and repeat sales. Now, why does all this matter? What's the point? What can you do with this information? Well, for starts, knowing exactly who you are and who your audience is might be, is perhaps the only uh, real way to target the right audience because without targeting the right audience, it's like throwing the wrong bait in a big pond and wondering why the fish don't bite. Number two, uh, seven seconds. Seven seconds is all you have to connect with your audience. And knowing what to say is a function of knowing who to say it to. Your messaging becomes clear cut, direct, and hits your audience square between the eyes um, when you know who you're, talk who you're talking to and who you're talking about. The marketing machine is, can only reach its full potential when the audience is so in love with your brand and its products and ethos that they're willing to tell anybody anywhere and anyone who will listen to it to jump, to jump on board. 
this level of loyalty takes a really deep understanding of your, your identity and your consumer's identity. And it's also known as the product market fit. A global study says that consumers are four to six times more likely to purchase, protect, and champion purpose-driven companies. Without understanding your brand's existential identity and purpose, your growth efforts will become an uphill battle with consumers who will be quick to, to switch to the purpose-driven, more purpose-driven competitor in a heartbeat. When your brand identity becomes so unique, it not only attracts attention, it commands it. As humans, we love things that are out of the ordinary, that take us by surprise. We search for these things actively. The best media companies know this, and this is, and this is what helps them find you. And they are quick to find to jump on board with brands who have that unique identity. And finally, perhaps the most important uh, in the commerce world and your shareholders and your stakeholders is ROI. The marketing function, anyone who own, is a marketing manager or, or a brand owner knows that we always have less dollars to spend and more noise to make in an already noisy world. This, to succeed and perform it is absolutely crucial that dollars are spent where the right customers are, a facet that is only unlocked when you know how to identify the right ones and where they are and what channels they're on. We've been here for some time and I'm, I'm so stoked you stayed with me to learn a little bit about your identity, its role with you and its role with helping you shape your performance and your business performance in the, in, in the real world. It's really incredible to be here. And I know we're all scattered around the world, you know, just all in different environments in this crazy, crazy time. Yet we're, we're united by such a beautiful and power, powerful thing, your identity. Own your identity, embrace it, and become the unstoppable force you are always meant to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johnny, for the presentation. And um, please follow him on this uh, QR code. It actually goes through to his um, medium, which is um, you can follow his insights, follow his expertise, and um, continue to follow his extraordinary story. He's a really good friend of mine in the, in the last few years, ex exponentially grown his career. So it's really good to see on the sidelines. My name is Kevin Singh. I'm the co-chair here in the Sydney chapter. And I really want to first off, thank everyone for joining on a Saturday. I'm very optimistic because it is a Zoom call and I know there's a lot of Zoom fatigue this year. I think the, the word of the year must have been you're on mute. And I think there's been lots of drinking games associated with whenever that word gets said. Um, as kind of really beautifully put by Gary, um, this particular group is made by the people for the people. And I think the aim of today for the launch, even though we are on a Zoom call, is to demonstrate that, that there is an extreme amount of value that we're presenting to the group and we're not asking for even a dollar. If we kind of look from the start, our team that we've got in the, in the chapter here, there's professionals that have a background in law, a background in accounting, real estate, sales, marketing. We've got business owners. We've got people that are life coaches and basically there's such an exposure of different types of skills which i'm hoping to connect people up with in sydney for the sole purpose of having growth minded discussion um I'm, I'm a keen believer of um once you teach you learn twice so this is why i'm really passionate about it as well um so i'm really hoping to see if we can kind of continue this on a month to month basis and go from there that's where my next point comes where it is a mastermind session so you only get out what you put in We've got a very strong turnout for a Zoom call on Saturday morning. I'm sure people have got lunch plans and all kinds of different things. Um, but what I want to kind of say is that this is kind of due to the environment that we're dealing with right now. In the future, we'll more, be more than happy to have this in an in-person live format, which will allow us to cross-pollinate and network with people we normally wouldn't see. Going across the participant list, I think I know about half of them so it's really it's really exciting for me um, as well because I'm, I'm kind of we're, we're going to be pivoting off the ideas of what's coming off today membership membership is free there is no cost associated with membership at all the call out is um, basically you have the ability to network globally with our network i think there's 2800 uh, members globally right now across the various continents i saw a call out this morning on the on the message board where somebody needed 
either a person who works in uh, criminal law in LA or knows a friend that works in criminal law in LA. I think that was fulfilled within an hour. Given that there's so many different time zones, you have the ability to really connect up with people you will get exposed to. Now, in saying that, I'm sure there are some questions for Johnny Butler. I know he's been speaking for a while, but I really want the opportunity to open it up in, in the, the easiest way possible we can do in a Zoom environment. So I'd love to open it up to Johnny's presentation if there's any questions. And obviously, if there's any other questions um, with PCC, I'm happy to moderate. If you'd like to put the questions in the question and answer or put your hand up, more than happy to play it either way. I'd like to keep this as interactive as possible. And in saying that, we've got one question so far. Um, there we go. Oh, I, my name's Kevin. I'm sure he's from Punjab as well. Um, when is the first face-to-face -face chamber event in Sydney? Look, we're really excited to do a face-to-face -face event. It really depends on the COVID-19 restrictions. I think Sydney has been quite insulated from the global pandemic. Um, and I think there will be changes in the, next, in the coming months, um, but watch this space. Um, now, I'm just gonna quickly see if anyone's got their hand up. Don't be shy. This is the first one I know but really, really excited to see your thoughts. I mean, is there anything that we missed? Um, we've got a few minutes, so more than happy to kind of open it up. How can I be a volunteer? Reach out to me, reach out to Silky. Um, we can definitely add you um, to the group. Um, there is, there is a, a small process that allows us to um, kind of vet the types of um, skill sets that um, kind of would enhance the group. Um, so please reach out to me. I'll, I'll pass on my details to you after this call. Okay, I'm gonna quickly go here. So there's one from Vinay. Uh, congrats to uh, Gary for opening Sydney and 2,800 members. Great work, Johnny. There you go. Sometimes the statement is better than the question, isn't it, Johnny? <laughs> Um, from Dolly, at what point did Johnny realize to embrace his identity? So Johnny, the floor is yours, my friend. Oh, okay. Wow. Amazing question. Um, interesting, interesting, interesting story because I, I, my sister was telling me about a time where I came home from school and uh, someone had dared me to, to change the color of my vodka uh, when I went to school. And I used to always wear the same colored uh, vodka. So it would be matching the same, the school uniform. And I'd always be wearing uh, the blue, the blue Navy. And uh, I came home one day and I said to mom, I said, mom, someone has dared me to, to change the color of my vodka and, uh, and I'll get $10 for it. And um, she was like, what? Like, why, why would you do that? And, you know, and I was like, it's, it's fine. It's the same thing, but it's just a different color, right? Like we can make, I can make $10, you know, that's like lunch for, you know, two months <laughs> because you didn't really get an allowance at school. Um, so uh, it was at that point where I think my mom realized that I didn't know that I was getting bullied. And, and um, it, it largely for, for a very long time, I actually never really realized that I was. And um it was only the real harsh things that would come in through a schoolyard uh, when, when it started, I started to really question as I grew older who I was and, and what this actually meant for me in the, in the culture. Um, and it, there was a bit of an inflection point where once I did start to realize that I was uh, very visually different um, and people had these biases against um, minorities or you know, what you look like uh, became a real uh, big thing. Uh, there was a time where I needed to really embrace the difference and I created this mentality where uh, I wanted to be so normal that I could jump into all these different fields and uh, prove that I was normal and, and surprise people that I was. So um, I really embraced it, I would say, when I was maybe about 15 at that age, uh, where I created that philosophy of being driven to be different and uh, almost to be out to get, uh, to get people like, haha, surprise. Uh, it's, it's not, don't judge the book by its cover. It's not what you think. So yeah, a very young age, but um, not as young as probably most uh, Sikh boys anyway would, would see. Really? Thanks for that, Johnny. Look, we've, got a, we've got a question from Hami. Can we get a short profile created for everyone so we can connect with others based on our common interests, etc.? cetera? Um, yeah, not a problem, Hami. Silky and I will work with Gary to kind of collate that as a group. And um, Junior can also help with that. So I think that's a great that's a great point, given that there are such a diverse range of skills across the 10 people that are 
are kind of starting this as a foundational team, uh, more than happy to connect up and, and provide you with that. Thank you for your question. Um, we've got another one here. I'm just, I'm just going to... Right. So how do you enable entrepreneurs for startups and job seekers, especially now after March? This kind of an initiative will play gold for SMBs and individuals with talent. I have a story myself to share and would find a lot of value in this forum. Um, so the forum will kind of run on a month to month basis and, and, and we are scheduling for um, future speakers. Um, so we can definitely have a chat offline about this. Um, Silky, if you just want to jump in, is there something that we could share as a, as a group to answer this? And maybe even Gary? I, I could do it if you want. Really? Yeah, so um, the, way, the way it is, is that every, there are gonna be networking events and then we have um, internship and other job opportunities we're gonna be posting on our website. So as the group grows, the benefits will grow for everyone in it. So that's the whole idea. So in terms of if you do, if you are looking for something, you know, it, it behooves you to ask and let us, let us know that you're looking so that we can try to help you. So uh, that, that's the way, uh, you know, we would do it. So first become a member and, and basically email us or in message, uh, in app message us and uh, we'll, we'll get on it. And that's said from the, the, the founder himself. So, you know, that's golden. Um, so there's another question from Lisa, Johnny, amazing presentation. Um, uh, what's been one of your key inspirations and driving factors to accept your uniqueness and share it? Alrighty. Um, great question, Lisa. Thank you. I guess your biggest inspiration is the first relationships that you have in the world, uh, when you come out and, uh, my biggest inspiration in this facet is absolutely, it has to be my dad. Um, we call him the, the Captain Cook of Sydney. He came here about 45 years ago um, and he came, to, came here on $6 and was an engineer, landed on a Sunday, didn't start on Monday until Monday. And so he had to walk from the airport um, just to find a place that would take him on with all his luggage. He was the first one in his family to move out, move out of the entire country. And... Um, and that's, that in itself is such an incredible story and there's so many ways we can go with it. But the person he is in, in what was, when he entered was a white Australia policy. It was an actual policy that said, we want just white people uh, here to be here and that's it. And so no one, absolutely no one even knew what Indians were at that time, uh, let alone uh, people with uh, colored skin. And for someone who's left everything behind him, uh, he's one of 13 kids uh, that he left behind in, in, in India, in Punjab, in Delhi. He came here by himself in a, in a predominantly uh, you know, white society and not only stayed the course in terms of what his techno technical skill set was uh, as an engineer, he then went above and beyond and became an entrepreneur. He did. He did anything to everything. He ran a security company, he ran a travel agency. Um, <laughs> he just, anything, you, any type of business, a restaurant, a, a hotel, anything you can think of, he did it. And he never let his identity ever um, get to him. And in fact, what he was a master in was uh, adapting to his environment and everything that he that was thrown to, to him. And a great case of example is that uh, when he, when he was selling wholesale uh, gifts and handicrafts, people didn't want to talk to him over the phone if he, if he said his name was Lockbeer. So uh, one day he got the idea, they said, okay, actually it's Bob speaking. And he's like, yeah, Bob, we'll, we'll, do, a, we'll, we'll do a business with Bob for sure, 100%. And then when they met him, they were like, who are you? Like, you know Bob. He's like, I'm Bob. He's like, all right, Bob, let's do business. And so he, he found a way to crack, crack through and use those skills, use his uh, identity almost to an advantage at, at some point in time. So um, he's my biggest inspiration for uh, who I am today in this, in this facet. That's a, great, that's a great question there. Um, we've got one last one, I think, uh, given time. Um, that's from Sandeep. Um, Question for Johnny, such a great presentation. What would you say is the best way to identify yourself when you are, when you're at a networking event? Which might be relevant to today. Uh, how to identify yourself at a networking event. Um, 
there's zoom makes it really interesting so it's uh there's there's the raise your hand tool i believe or um like people are doing adding their adding their questions and writing really great questions that spur the the thought of the of the panelists or the speakers something that is so intelligent or is a statement or a question that is so intelligent that actually gets the the panelists or the recipient to actually think about uh you and the person who asked that question or statement so um, there's many ways. Um, you, you can raise your hand. You can ask a question. Um, you can be part of the of the other side of the table. Um, a lot of people uh, feel that when they go to a networking event, they're attending. But you're you are the event. Uh, you the reason the event is there is because of you. So you have a, such a profound uh, amount of power within to leverage, and you shouldn't kind of hide in the in the corner or or anything. You should really challenge yourself to go and talk to people as much as possible, even if it's to get their first name and say hello. Um, all the magic happens when you say hello, that's 50% of the battle. And uh, once, you, once you just announce yourself and you say that you're there, um, then all the magic happens. Thank you for that. I think we're coming to close. So I just want to say in closing once again, um, please sign up as a member, um, please leverage this opportunity to share your story and also learn from others. As, as we said, this is made by the people for the people and it's, we're only as good as the group that we have. Um, it's a great opportunity, something different that I don't think has been introduced in Australia. I know there's some mastermind groups that are Australia, New Zealand specific. Um, this is something that's at a global level. Um, so really excited to see what comes off the back of this. We're gonna be very, um, Silky and I will be communicating with the Sydney chapter to basically show what's up next. And as I said, if there's any interest to um, share your story, um, do something like how Johnny did today very um, amazingly, um, please reach out to me. I'll share my details and let's have a conversation. Um, that's, that's all I'd like to say in closing. So thank you very much for your time and I hope everyone enjoys their Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Johnny. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Gary. Thank, thank you, Sylvie. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Thank you.